Hello, my name is Daryl and I'm an alcoholic. It's been almost two years since my last drink. Well, it had been until last night. I've been having a real tough time with it lately and I guess I backslid. They're back, you see. The monsters of my childhood. And I wish to. And I don't think I can deal with them without the sauce. This isn't the first time, but this time... Oh man, I think I made a huge mistake. You're all going to laugh at me. That's okay, I, I've been laughed at before, I, I, and I don't care. I just have to get this off my chest. I started drinking to forget something I couldn't remember in the first place. Except deep down in that reptilian part of my brain. It was a, an instinctual dread, like the rabbit that shrinks at the shadow. I remember lying awake terrified, but not knowing why. The night I remember most clearly of those dark days was a summer night when I was... 11? The magic hour was dimming. It seemed to last forever in my youth, like a low note played on the strings of a cello drawn out for an eternity. The sky was fading from purple to navy blue, and the night was turning the leaves of the box elder tree outside my window from nuanced green to a uniform gray. All around a still night was enveloping the world in a silent embrace. Yes, the silence. That was the source of my dread. Every other summer night, the world was an orchestra of singing nightingales and chirping crickets, of squirrels scurrying up trees and raccoons rooting through garbage. But when they came, it was always silent. Even my house, usually alive until the late evening with the sounds of my father's television, was quiet. He was deep within his cups that night. I remember that very clearly, too. I, I, I pulled the blankets up to my chin. My body was as stiff as a board, yet trembling like a feather in the wind. I felt my heart racing in my chest, pounding so hard I thought it would break my ribs at any moment. My mouth was dry and foul-tasting, and who felt it would years later when waking from a bender. Gripping, white knuckled on the sheets, I felt my bed begin to vibrate. The tremor was so slight that at first I thought it might be my own quaking. As the shaking grew stronger, I felt the leaves on the box elder begin whipping violently, as if before a gale. I noticed, too, that I could once again make out their colors. The world outside my window was growing light again. The last thing I remember was no more than a sensation, a certainty that I was no longer alone in my room. When I awoke the next day, I had no recollection of what happened the night before. I wouldn't remember until years later. I do recall feeling anxious and violated, emotions for which I could not determine the source. I asked my dad if he remembered anything strange about the night before, to which he replied, Shut the fuck up. He was hungover. That wasn't the last night I lay terrified in my bed. It wasn't the first, either. Just the one I remember most clearly. The nightmares came a little later. I'm not exactly sure when. I may have been 16 or 17. Maybe younger. But they were very distinct, very memorable dreams. I guess everyone has nightmares about being naked in front of a group of people at that age. Only in my dreams, they weren't really people. In my dreams, I'm in a room of dull gray metal lying on a table. The light is dim and has a faint purplish hue to it, like the bruises under the eyes of an insomniac. I don't think they see in the same spectrum as us, because it's always that twilight. Violet, hinting at deep blue light. I don't see them at first, but I can sense a number of entities behind me. The one I think of as the doctor is behind me, standing at the head of the examining table. I can't see him, but I can sense him there, feel his thoughts. This is the first part of the exam. He's checking to make sure nothing's wrong. I'm under their control. When he assures himself of this, he circles around the table. And, and I see him. 
That's a monster. At first, I find it hard to focus on his face, as if his features were made of caro syrup, which will hold no definition. Eventually, I realize that the effect is just a trick of my mind, a defense to prevent me from seeing a horror I can't comprehend. defense, too, finally breaks down. How to describe something so inhuman? I, I, I can't use terms like chin or, and cheek without belying the nature of the thing. It has nothing which can be described as a chin or cheeks, no brow nor nose, but something which might be described as a mouth. A gaping horror show, jagged points, and dripping opaque white fluid. What I think of his eyes are so high on the oblong head that they look like horns. But I don't know if they're even eyes. Or merely darker bumps on the orange skin. And the second act of the nightmare begins. The floating, creeping terror of the mental probe is over. Next, the external be the exam begins. He runs various instruments against my skin, against my most intimate parts. With a cold mechanical efficiency that demonstrates his experience. In the back of my mind, beneath the blanket of fear and revulsion, I wonder how many times he's done this. Then there's the question I wish never had occurred to me. How many times has he done this to me? I open my mouth to scream, but no sound emerges. Act 2 continues with the mechanical efficiency of a Swiss clock. Act 3 is more horrible than the first two. A fitting climax to the tragedy that is thus far unfolded. I can't describe the rest, not, not even if I wanted. But always in my mind, that memory lurks like the shadow of a predator beneath the murky waters of a swamp. Waiting. Always waiting. Until today, I've never been able to admit even to myself that happened when I was growing up. Not long after the dreams began, I started drinking. I knew the instant I felt that gauzy veil of insobriety pulled over my mind that I'd never be the same again. At last, I could escape the harsh light of reality behind the shadow of alcohol. It was like Novocaine for my psyche, no longer forced to feel, to deal with the trauma of those nightmare horrors that flooded my mind. I felt free. I've told you all a hundred times the next part of my story. In our group, it's like the refrain of an old familiar song that kind of gets stuck in your head. I found the bottom of a bottle and made a home there for the next seven years. At the end, there was nothing. Living on the street, eating out of trash cans, begging for change for just one more drink. Just one more sweet release from the nightmares. I hid rock bottom in a jail cell, leaning my face on an unspeakably filthy stainless steel toilet fighting the DTs. I looked around the cell and saw half a dozen other rummies like myself, some older, a few younger, and I knew that there weren't many old lushes, at least not to the degree of my own drinking. I looked into the toilet, and like some charlatan auger, saw my future in my own sick. Die in a bottle, or live without it? I came to a meeting the next day, and I've been dry ever since until yesterday. It was the terrors I felt at night as a boy. They began to come back. It started again four months ago. Lying in bed on a February night, the wind howling through the fire escape, I was suddenly filled with fear. It was the familiar sensation like deja vu or an old friend come home. I trembled, yet fed paralyzed. And gripping the covers, I stared at the window all the while, praying for the night to remain black. I thought I saw... No, 
I did see a hint of light. And the next I awoke, I felt the shame all over again. Finally, last night, I could take it no longer. I went to the store and bought a case of beer. My sick mind told me that just a few beers wouldn't be like falling off the wagon. Hell, it wasn't the rock gut whiskey, not the hard stuff. I just needed something to ease my mind. Less than an hour after I cracked open the first can and the smell of hops hit my nose, I was blacked out. This time, the lost memory was not their doing, but my own. When I woke up this morning, I realized what a terrible mistake it had all been. My apartment looked like Dresden after the Allied bombers had their say. Beer cans, the whole case worth naturally, littered the carpet. There were cigarette burns on the night table, broken furniture in the corner. What might have once have been a kitchen chair was now a pile of unrecognizable splinters. It slept on the floor. The mattress turned on its side, the box spring broken in half. I saw smears of blood on the door jamb and connected it to my throbbing hand. The knuckles were busted wide open. Their control of me worked on my mind. Not a physical restraint, but a mental one. I guess the booze messed with their control, and I guess that when they came for me last night, I wasn't the helpless, paralyzed 11-year-old they were expecting. It was the doctor. Or, I think it was the doctor. Maybe they're like monarch butterflies that all look the same except to the trained eye. I heard a clattering sound from the kitchen, and that's where I found it. The monster of my childhood was lying on my kitchen floor broken and beaten by me in a drunken rage. It was so small, so fragile, the size of a child. It reminded me of seeing my father for the last time, after the cancer had him down to a skeleton wrapped in skin and began to gnaw into the bones. I hated my father. But that last time I saw him, all that anger melted away, and I only felt sad for the he wasn't the monster of my youth any more than the doctor. The doctor died, just like my father. My anger and shame came bubbling up. I ran to the bathroom and was violently sick. I felt so weak afterwards that I laid my head on the filthy toilet. Deja vu all over again. And I saw this time, not my future, but rather my past in the filthy mess. It wasn't my fault. The monsters, my father, there was nothing I did to deserve any of it. When I went back to the kitchen, the body and my shame were gone. As if I had sicked up some poison in my soul and with it the horrible thing that was done to me. I know this all sounds so crazy, especially since I'm just some tired drunk. I don't care. I just had to tell someone so that I can be free of the last bit of poison. Off the Wagon by Rosalind Meadows starred Bob Brinkman as Daryl. The music was written by Cole McLeod produced by David Nagel. <laughs>